we'd like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast. This podcast is from December 22nd, 2013. Today we'll be with Pastor Trevor in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. Thank you for joining us today, and Merry Christmas. I thought we'd just take a, a week. We haven't really talked about this Christmas. Just talk about what, what the incarnation means, what, what it means to, to, um, to celebrate Christmas. And, and obviously we've gotten, um, my dad and I went shopping yesterday, and we went to the mall. And it was, it was the word peace didn't really come to mind. Um, we parked. Like, by there's a tire place when you pull into the mall up there. And we parked, like, way over there. And it was hard to find a spot there. And just getting into the store was unbelievably difficult. Um, and uh, it was just people running around. And, and you feel all this pressure. Um, you know, uh, you want to get just the right gift. And you want to do all this stuff. And, and I think sometimes we just we get all spun up with that part of it. And, and we kind of miss the, the, the beauty of it, you know. And... And uh, maybe it's not a kind of thing, but I, I also don't want to, to make you feel guilty about how you choose to celebrate Christmas, because I think there's some of that that goes on as well, um, where um, people get so, um, you, know, you know, a lot of times people like write a book about how you should really gear down Christmas, and then they make millions off the book. I don't really understand how that works exactly, but, uh, you know, you, you do... You, you think about it how you want to think about it, I'll think about it how I want to think about it, but uh, uh, but I do think we need to slow down and and really enjoy this time and think about what happened and um, and truly celebrate the fact that Jesus did come to earth, that he, he is God with us, He's, he, and if it wasn't for the birth, there would be none of that, and, and so it's awful hard to look at you for I'm sorry, if I don't look over here anymore, because you're it. You're like the, this is like the, the what was that? A mighty four, yeah. All right, but it's a little, it's like we're, we're listed this way a little bit here. So anyway, um, I'll try to give you a little love here in a little bit. But um, anyway, um, you know, I, I think we get kind of caught up and spun up with, with everything that goes on. And, and if you're not careful, there's all kinds of pressure. I've talked to tons of people this just this Christmas um, I meet with uh, I meet with people throughout the week, and we have a couple different groups to meet with and just hang out and talk. And and uh, in, in one of those groups, uh, it's made up of, of mostly pastors, and um, every one of them was almost dreading uh, Christmas because of how busy it was and how how you know um, you had to go to this fam this part of the family and this part of the family. If you didn't spend as much time with this part of the family as you did with this part of the family, this part of the family gets mad and. and uh, and, and it's just like, yeah, it's just what Jesus meant when he, you know, when he came. And, and uh, so I think that, that what we need to do is just take some time this morning, um, back up just a little bit from all the hustle and bustle, and just look at what happened and, and what it means, and, and think about God with us. And, and just we'll go over the story here in um, uh, Matthew chapter 1. He goes through the genealogy of Jesus to, to start with. And uh, then, then we fall into verse number 18 right here. And it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. So this is the story. This is how the birth happened. This is the incarnation. Um, it wasn't... Uh, the other. There's another version of this in Luke. And uh, Luke's a little more detailed about everything that happens uh, up to the birth and how there was a, a, a census or a tax being collected at the time and everybody had to go to their hometown. That's why uh, Mary and Joseph went to um, uh, Bethlehem. And, um, and, and uh, you know, it tells the whole story about how the shepherds were in the field and, and, and all of a sudden uh, an angel shows up and they're terrified. And, and you can imagine, just a normal night, all of a sudden an angel showing up and then a whole host of angels uh, and the crazy thing is, it was they showed up to shepherds. Shepherds were um, as blue collar, uh, to put it nicely. They were as blue collar as you could get. Um, they they were just a, a, a forgotten group of people. They weren't. Uh, they had no social significance. They took care of the people's herds who had social significance. Right? I mean, they were just 
animal keepers. They were, they were uh, as a matter of fact, the Egyptians, um, if you remember reading about uh, when Joseph uh, was there and his whole family came over, they wouldn't even let him live in Egypt. They lived in Goshen because they couldn't stand shepherds. They didn't want to be around them. It was gross to be in the same room with them. You know, and um, uh, so that's sort of how they were looked at, and yet that's who the birth announcement's made to. Um, so it's just uh, so many amazing things surrounding the story. But um, verse number eighteen. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way: when his Mary, his mother, excuse me, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. In other words, <laughs> they, they, had, they had been engaged, and it was a, it was a contractual engagement. You know. Um, I remember when I got engaged, um, it was the first time I kissed Joy. She wouldn't let me kiss her up to that point, and it wasn't for a lack of trying. Um, but uh, um, I might have got a cheek once in a while, uh, you know, I never could work my way around front, you know, but, uh, uh, but after, the diamond did the trick, uh, the, the diamond, you know, so anyway, um, that's what we're, what we're letting her think. Um, but anyway, um, but, but I remember... It was in my friend's, it was the most, it was the least romantic, uh, she's not anywhere near it, um, it was, <laughs> I thought I thought I heard something, um, but it was the least romantic thing probably ever, um, we were in Bible college, we had no, uh, I mean, had no money, uh, had no nothing, and, um, uh, and, and we went to a, a buddy of mine's house, we, we had to go on, when, the college I went to, you had to have chaperones to go out on a date. I know, it's a little antiquated. Um, uh, I, 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 anyway, I, I'll leave it up to you to, to figure out what all that means. But um, we had to have a chaperone. And fortunately, we had good friends of ours were married, so they could be our chaperone. And, and they let us ride in the back seat. It was kind of cool. But anyway, um, <laughs> you got the fat girl in the cheek all the time. And it, was, it was awesome. But anyway, um, so, anyway, we, we, we go to their apartment. They lived in low-income housing in the bad part of Knoxville. That's where I got engaged. That's where I decided to pop the big question. And uh, so I had it set up, and I, I, I pulled out the ring, and, and uh, they had a little bench there, and, and uh, we went inside to grab something, and, and uh, uh, then I got on one knee while she sat on the bench, and I, I reached under, and the, the ring was there, and I had a flower, maybe a flower of flowers, I can't remember, and I proposed. And anyway, um, Long, well, I don't know if this has anything to do with anything, but but my friends actually gave us that bench later, and we still have it in our in our room. Wow. And uh, so yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, that's the only redeeming quality of that uh, that uh, scene. Um, the next, well, seriously, like the next week, a friend of mine got engaged, and he actually took her up into the mountains and rode a white horse with a suit of armor on to get engaged. That's seriously what he did. And so there, he's sitting there telling the story with, with me and Joy, like a week after I had just gone to the low-income apartments in Knoxville and, and asked my wife to marry me. And he's like, yeah, I got on a horse, and, and I rode it, and she was in a field, and, and I came riding up, and I was in a suit of armor, and I got off, and I was like, that's kind of creepy, first of all, but uh, whatever. Uh, so... Anyway, but we got engaged, and, and uh, I, it was one of the most exciting times of our lives, you know? I mean, it, it really was, and all downhill from there. But uh, I, I'm just kidding. Is it, come on, Merry Christmas. Laugh a little. But, uh, but uh, no, it just got better and better, but, but it was super exciting. Up to that point, it was the most exciting thing that happened, you know? And, and, and I'm guessing that's how it was with them, two young uh, you know, people, and marrying was obviously something special. I mean, from, from what happens in this story, she was clearly something special. Um, Joseph was a hard-working guy. Uh, they were, they, they got together. I don't know if it was arranged or whatever, but they were together. They were betrothed. They were engaged, and they were going to get married. That was, that was as good as married contractually back then. To get out of the engagement period, you had to get a certificate of divorce. It was just, there was a period of time between the betrothal and, and the actual uh, uh, consummation of, the, of, of the, uh, the, and the, the party and everything that went along with that. But they were in that period of time. They were together. They were, they were each other's. Um, but they, haven't, uh, they hadn't had the, the relationship consummated at this point in time. So, um, his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. And before they came <laughs> together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, we've talked about this angle before, um, 
And it, it just, it, it's amazing. I, I wonder how this conversation went. You know, you know, Joseph, I, sit down, we have to talk. Good news, bad news. All right? Now we'll start with the bad news. I'm pregnant. Good news is with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, I don't under, how do you say, honestly, if, if, if I was engaged once, if Joy would have come to me with that story, it would have been over. I'd be like, okay, first of all, you're unfaithful. Second, you're nuts. All right? This isn't happening. You, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not doing this. I mean, are, is anybody, I know it seems like sacrilege to talk like this, but it's true. How would you feel? How would you react? It's like, okay, I'm pregnant, but it's okay because God did it. You know? It's from the Holy Spirit. You know? And, and I, I'm sure Joseph was like, his mind was blown. And I'm sure Mary, who, who had said okay to everything when, 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 when the angel appeared to her, and, and, and she said, it's impossible. I've never known a man. And, and, and the angel said, with God, anything's possible. And she said, whatever you want to do. She said that knowing that it might ruin her relationship with her fiancé. All her plans and dreams were ruined from that point forward. What does every little girl grow up dreaming about? It's her wedding day. The big day, right? I, I, I mean, I don't know if every one of you did, but, but I know my daughter does. By the way, you got to pray for my daughter. Her gerbil's extremely ill. Um, and and, and it's, it, it, it's, it's bad. It's bad. I don't think there's any coming back. I don't know. I've never, I've never been around a sick gerbil before, but it's definitely not looking good. One side works perfect. The other side's not doing anything. I, I don't know exactly what that means. Um, but um, she's spending the night with someone Monday, so he may get all better between Sunday and Monday if we can find another one that looks exactly like him. But anyway, we'll see. Um, I don't know. It's a miracle. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. So pray for us to find a creative solution to this problem. Um, the, the funeral arrangements were made yesterday, though. I'm the first speaker. I think Jordan's second and Justin's third. Um, followed by a few songs. So I don't know exactly how it's going to go. But, but anyway, but she's always dreamed of being, you know, that's what she thinks about is, you know, uh, this kind of stuff. She's all a girl. You know, she thinks about this. And, and no doubt Mary grew up dreaming of this day. She was betrothed. You know, what's the first thing you do after you get engaged, ladies? You show everybody... Look at the rock, right? Joy was like, if you can see it, check it out, you know? <laughs> if you got any vision problems at all, this may be difficult. Um, but, but, you know, she's like, you know, you get to take pictures, you, you do the thing where both your hands are in the Bible, and you got the ring, you know? And, and you know, you go through all the ring roll, you show it off, you do everything, because it's exciting, it's great. And then Mary has everything blown up by, by God Almighty. By implanting in her the God child, the man child, Jesus Christ, who would be 100% uh, God and 100% man. The only way he could be 100% God and 100% man was to be born of a virgin. Not be fathered, not, not have his, 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 his bloodlines tainted with the, 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 the line of Adam. But rather to be implanted in her womb, the, 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 the seed of God, and, and so she would give birth to a man, a 100% man, yet 100% divine. That's the only way it could happen. And God said, that, sent the angel and said, you're the one, and she said, okay. That would be difficult. That would be, that would be a hard, hard thing to, to try to process through that, that all these plans are ruined now. God has a way of Changing up our plans, doesn't he? Sometimes. Sometimes. Um, but it's never for a, a worse thing. You know, it's never for a worse thing. Um, it may seem like it, but God says it's always working together for good. And we trust him in that. And so she says, okay, and then she's got to break it to Joseph. She's got to sit him down and have a little chat. You know? And, and so Joseph's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to divorce you. That, that's basically what he does, right? Um, okay, great. Good to hear Okay, thanks for being honest, but I want to be honest too. We've got to figure something out. And I'm not going to make a big public scene about it, he says, so here he goes. Verse number 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. In other words, he wasn't going to make a big deal about it, but, you know, this isn't for me. This isn't, this isn't what I'm doing. 
He resolved to divorce her quietly. I'm going to say, okay, we'll just quietly end it, not ask any questions, and I'll go my way, you go your way, and, you know, I hope the Holy Spirit thing works out. You know, I hope that works out for you. That is a difficult life. It's, it's, it's difficult now. It was impossible then. Impossible. I mean, if you got pregnant out of wedlock, I mean, you know, it was, it was, often you just got sent away to something. And this happened all the way up through the 50s and 60s here. You know, if, if you got a family member that got pregnant out of wedlock, there was not much love for you. You got sent away to an aunt's house in Nebraska for finishing school. And, and, and you know, uh, when you had the baby, sometimes you either gave it, some, gave it up for adoption or something, and then you came back like nothing ever happened. And, and that happened a lot because there was a shame and moms and dads' identities were wrapped up in having the perfect kids instead of loving kids, right? Loving them where they're at. And the church would turn their back too. we got to be really careful how we treat people because everybody makes mistakes and we deal with people where they're at, not in the what-if world of if they were perfect because none of us are. Some of our sins are more public than others, but all of us need the church. We need each other, regardless of how we fall, regardless of the mistakes we make, and we need to think forward and think with love rather than, wow, that's really embarrassing to our family, that's really embarrassing to our church, we've got to just kind of put this away. That's, a, that's completely the, the wrong attitude. But that's the way it was. And so Joseph's like, well, I'm not going to make a big deal of this, but I'm going to divorce you quietly. But as he considered these things, he, he wasn't rash. That's what I like about Joseph. He, he didn't just, he didn't storm out, we don't think. He didn't just say, I'm done, it's over. He considered it. He thought about it. He, 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 I'm sure the fact of what he knew about Mary and her honesty and her uh, beauty and the fact that she was uh, um, um, just a, a, of all the women there, according to God Almighty, she was special. She was special. And he probably started thinking, she's not a liar. She's not a liar. There, there's got to be something here. And he was considering these things. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, that's, that's a pretty amazing dream to have. But whatever, however real the dream was, whatever uh, it, 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 it struck a chord with Joseph, and, and he said, okay. He said, okay. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, he took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to his son, and he called his name Jesus. That's a beautiful, beautiful story. But the most beautiful part of the story is, is the fact that this fulfilled the scripture in Isaiah 7, 14, that said, uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she calls his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, we celebrate Christmas, and we give gifts at Christmas time, um, because we're celebrating the greatest gift of all. It puts us in the, in the, in the mindset of giving, and, and, and well, some of us it puts us in the mindset of giving and getting, but it puts us in the mindset of giving and, and, and saying, you know, it, it's, it's um, you know, the gift was so special. Here is a, 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 a earthly uh, 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 picture of that great gift. That's, that's what we're doing. We're giving, we're exchanging gifts to celebrate the gift. Because if it wasn't for this gift, we would have nothing to celebrate. The whole point of the gospel is God with us. God indwells us. God saves us. God uh, um, loves us. And without this birth, without Jesus doing what he did, it would be impossible. Without Jesus being virgin born by Mary, I, I believe this is an absolutely true event. I don't have any doubt in my mind that it's a true event. That, that a virgin had a baby from God Almighty, and his name was Jesus, and he grew up, he was sinless, he lived a, a perfect life, he, did, he fulfilled the law's demands. 
Because when the law came in, it was, it was to show us that we can't. It wasn't to fulfill in ourselves. It was to show us that we couldn't fulfill it. I'm a liar. I hope that wasn't a huge revelation for you. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm a liar. I've told lies before. I've done things and said things to, to make me look better so that I would get in trouble. I've done that. You have too. I've murdered somebody. Okay, wait, wait, just a second. Uh, there is no statute of limitations on murder. If you have done that, don't say it out loud. We have certain legal obligations. Uh, but, but the Bible says if you think a bad thought toward, a hateful thought towards somebody, it's, in God's economy, it's, it's equal to murder. If you thought a lustful thought about somebody, it's equal to adultery. We have broken God's law. And Paul said if you've broken it in one point, you've broken it all. Uh, we're hopeless. We're helpless. The only thing the law does, it's a cruel taskmaster. The only thing the law does is point us to the, to the very harsh reality that we can't do this. I cannot fulfill the Ten Commandments because if I've been guilty once, I'm guilty of it all. So what's the remedy? The remedy is you're going to be under the wrath of God forever and ever if left to your own devices. Or there is a Savior. Jesus came. He was born. He lived a perfect life. Not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. He fulfilled the law's demands. He, he kept every commandment. He was the God-man. He did not, could not, would not sin. He was perfect, sinless, innocent. And He went to the cross to die for us to take our place. Right? The blood sacrifice. Every, the, all those, the, 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 the blood of the, the bulls and the goats and everything else that, 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 that they were killed. They were, they, their blood was, was, was used to throw against the altar and to, to sprinkle on this and put on this to signal forth the fact that Jesus was coming and the Lamb of God would take away the sins of the world. And so Jesus came. He died on the cross. He shed His blood. The Bible says in Isaiah that by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he went to the cross and he took our sins. He, he, it's called our substitutionary atonement. Jesus went to the cross and took our place. He went there in our stead. And when he died, he yelled something. The, the whole earth turned black, uh, dark for three hours while he was on the cross. And at the end of that, as God poured out His wrath on Jesus that we deserve, the Father poured out His wrath on the Son so that, that we could live. And as Jesus was sitting there, at, at, at the end of that three hours, He cried before He gave up the ghost. He cried, it is finished. Testelestai in the Greek, which means paid in full, so that all our sins had been paid for by Jesus on the cross. God poured His wrath out on Him by His stripes, we are healed, and, and, and by faith and belief in Him, we have Him indwell us, and His righteousness imputed onto us, so that God looks at us not as if we uh, used to be sinners, but as if we were never even sinners at all. Because He looks at us as the same way He looks at His Son, because His Son took our place, and, I, and was in our stead, and His righteousness is what makes us righteous, not our own. Because He did it for us. And, and, and that's what we live for here. We're not ashamed of that. We're not ashamed of that. You know, that's what sets us apart. You know, we're not Christian. This isn't, this isn't um, a place for, for just conservatives. This isn't a place for just liberals. This isn't a place for just uh, Democrats, Republicans, uh, uh, you know, the dynasty lovers or not. You know, whatever. This isn't just for you. This is a place where we love everybody. We love our enemies. We love our friends. We love people. We tell the truth, but we love. We're not, we're not distinguished by our, our harshness or, yeah, we're going to tell the truth no matter what. We're distinguished by the fact that we can genuinely disagree, but we also genuinely love. Right? By the way, disagreement doesn't equal hatred. Right? Disagreement doesn't equal um, uh, bigotry. Disagreement is disagreement, and we can have a dialogue about things, but people need to know that we love first and foremost, even in, not because we agree, but in spite of the fact that we don't agree. Right? And we can sit down, we can talk things through, and we can still be friends afterwards. You know? Um, but, uh, so Jesus came, he died on the cross. He rose again the third day so that we could live forevermore with Him. 
Our lives are taken care of. We're going to be with Him forever and ever and ever. And, and, and God is with us so that we can be with God forever. All that could not be possible had this little story not happened. That's why this is a big deal. That's why I think Christmas should be magnified. It should be, it should be uh, lifted up as something that, well, we celebrate. We're not ashamed to celebrate it. You know, we're not going to try to back off or, or say well, we're not going to do this. And you can celebrate it however you see fit. Um, but here's the thing. We need to remember what it's about. This has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the love of God for us. We can't love others unless we understand that God loved us first. Right? We can't properly love Him if we think that we were the initiator. We weren't. He loved us first. And, and, and this was such a big deal that God came down and wrote Himself in flesh and came down and, 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 and was among us so that we could know Him. That's the best gift any of us could ever have. It's the gift. It's the reason we give gifts is because God did this for us. God with us. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's why we celebrate. That's why we got nativity scenes. I'm not sure why we have Christmas trees, but it, that, that's part of it, right? You know, it, it, it's I love Christmas time. I love getting together with family. I Honestly, I love giving gifts, and I like getting them. I'm not going to lie. Someone brought me one today. You're my new favorite church member. And I'll say who you are. But if you do that, you get right to the top of the list. It's just the way it is. It's in the Constitution. I don't make these things up. So anyway, um, but, but listen, I love to give gifts. I love the, I love the anticipation. I love doing it. And I can't imagine. I mean, I love, I've got something picked out for joy. I'm pretty stoked about it this year. And it turned out better than I thought. You ever have those gifts? Where you're like, hmm, kind of taking a risk. Then you get it in and you're like, no, you know, I can't wait. And, and I've got that kind of thing. And, and I hope she's feeling the same way. But anyway, um, but, but I've got that and I can't wait. The anticipation. And you know why? Because we love it when, when we see their faces light up. Right? When we know, wow, we gave them something they can use, that they like, they're blown away. It's more than they thought. It's just great. That's a great feeling, isn't it? it it's great to give. It is, and, and honestly, I like getting, but that's my fun. That's the funnest thing. We always have. Uh, are my kids in here? Any of them? Okay. We always have this thing where we 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 give them all the gifts, but then we save a couple of the ones that they really ask for for later. They know it, but it's still fun. I don't want them to know about. It. But but we have, and it's always so much fun that anticipation, that build up, because you can kind of see that they're yeah, I'm, I'm happy. You know, I'm glad. Thank you so much. But but that that one special gift that they wanted is just not there. You know, and they're, oh well, maybe next year. And, and and then you know, there's always like a there's always like a letter from I, you know. We're horrible sinners, but there's a letter from Santa or something, and it says, and there's always a puzzle or a map or something. They have to go figure it out and good luck and find it. They just have fun with it. I know my oldest is like 13 now, so it might not be as much fun for him, but we have a blast with it. We have fun with it, you know, and 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 um, we haven't busted out in Satan worship yet, so I think it's cool. But um, but they go around and, and something's in the back of a truck or something's under something and they find them. And man, their faces when they see that because they, they kind of, you know, rode that roller coaster a little bit. And then they, they finally get that thing and they're just like, yeah, you know, it's so cool. And you're like, yeah, you know. And so, but I can imagine how God must have felt to give the gift of his own son for us. And then to see the enthusiasm that we have when we get that gift, when it's fresh, when it's new, and we realize what God has done for us. And how that, that, that has to be such a great feeling, not only on our end, but it ha you know, the Bible says how the angels rejoice and heaven celebrates. You know, they're probably like, wait, wait, oh, it's close, it's close, I can't wait till, you know, and, and then God opens their eyes to the truth of him and they receive Jesus and they're so grateful and they're so thankful and all the angels are like, woo, you know, party or whatever and they're all excited and happy. And, but then, you know what drives you crazy about gifts? Is when you get that one thing they ask for and they're so excited when they get it and then two months later you find it all trampled under and all somewhere and it's not taken care of or, you know, I bought Justin a soccer ball. I'm never doing that again. You know, take care of it. This is your soccer ball. You, 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 you keep it on your feet. You walk with it. You 
you, you, you walk it around, you know, you sleep with it, you do everything. It's your ball. It's your, it's your, it's, we're a little extreme about soccer. But, you know, you, you, it's, it's right there. You know, that's your thing. You get used to it. You have a relationship with it. That's what, that's how you become a good soccer player. The relationship with the ball is everything. And, and you got to have it. You think it's true. It's true. Uh, you have to be morbidly uh, out of balance to be good at anything. So, anyway, um, but you have, you have this, uh, had this ball. And, and next thing you know, the ball's flat in the backyard, the dog's chewed up. That's so funny. <laughs> you know? Can you imagine what it must feel like for God to have given us a gift that's beyond measure? That's a gift we could never give Him back anything that even... You can't give God anything to make Him any better. You can't improve His life. He doesn't want an Xbox One, you know? He's not, he's not like, here God, He's like, woo, get it, you know? I mean, He knows it already. It's not, you know, hard to give a gift to it. Know, omniscience. But anyway, um, but but he gives us this gift, and it's so amazing. We're so blown away by it. And then four or five years down the road, we don't even think about him at Christmas. We get all caught up in the hustle and bustle. We don't think about him half the time. We don't bring him up. You know, he, he becomes a, a spiritual ATM machine where we need him. We make a withdrawal or whatever. That's not a thing. That's not that's not being grateful. So let's let, that, let's let that joy and that exuberance and that beauty of that gift that he gave us be freshened, be renewed, and, and, and let's go out and just celebrate with all our hearts the grandness and the beauty uh, of the fact that Jesus gave, uh, God gave us his son Jesus so that we could be with him forever and ever and ever. And every gift that we give this year may it flow from the overflow of that truth. That, that, that is just coming out of us, that is just flowing from us, the truth the, uh, and the joy and the glory of the fact that we're Christian, and that means everything. Amen? That's a big deal. That, that's, that's bigger than big. That's everything to us. That's why we exist. That's why we do what we do. And so let's celebrate with all our hearts this year, but let it, let, let's celebrate from the overflow of the gratefulness and the thanksgiving of what Jesus has done. Merry Christmas, and thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.